I remember well my very first sip of wine. I didn't like it. <laughs> You've got these guys, they get uprooted from their own country, forced over the border into a foreign country. No knowledge of wine, what do they end up doing? It's crazy to think we're going to be competing in a few weeks at the World Tasting Championships. A few years ago, none of us had ever tasted wine before. Joseph, Marvin, Tinashe, Van Pardon, Team Zimbabwe. It's like the Olympics of wine tasting. The wine could come from anywhere in the world. It's extremely difficult. It's like Egypt putting together a team of skiers to go and compete in the Winter Olympics. And then it just snowballed. Now we have a coach. He was once the best wine taster in the world. Bonjour! <laughs> uh, crazy character? I do, but I want. Do you think you can irritate Oh, immediately. The odds are stacked against them going to make history. In the mob, there was only the rich and the poor. Seven million people face starvation. I couldn't let my family starve. Luckily, we made it into South Africa, but we almost died. You tried to explain it to someone else. I wouldn't understand you. Our journey is tattooed in our hearts. It's difficult to take it off. Some of the most incredibly wonderful minds don't fit where we think they belong. We're proud to welcome you because you're the best palettes in the world. Looking in my life and where I've come from and where I've been. Mama, I love you all. I think I actually do believe in destiny. This is where my heart is, and this is where my heart will always be. Uh, Warwick Ross and Rob Code, co-directors of, of Blind Ambition, congratulations on this, this beautiful film. You've, you've pulled together something quite masterful, something very heartfelt, so, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Owen. Mate, coming off your last film, off, off Red Obsession, was it always your intention to stay with the, the personalities and the peculiarities of, of the wine industry? Yeah, I think um, I think for me it was because you know I'm, I'm my other hat is that I'm a winemaker on the Mornington Peninsula, so um, the wine world is something that feels really familiar, um, comfortable, and fun, and there's lots of great stories there. So Red Obsession was a, a particular kind of bent. It was more about the maybe the you know the, the shifting power from east to west, um, but the second film we felt that we wanted to make it more of a personal story. And, and so it was just a question of, of, of waiting until that popped up. And, you know, we'd been looking for a while, nothing that really grabbed us. And then we were contacted by Jancis Robinson um, from the UK, you know, who, who um, does her uh, wine article for the FT. And she's such a well-known person in the wine world. And she had heard this story uh, from a friend of hers in, in Cape Town and put us onto it. And so we, that's how we discovered it. <sighs> The nature of the documentary is that, that, that you, the filmmakers, you're not always certain of the, the narrative the, the film will ultimately tell. When did the, the key elements of blind ambitions start to come together? I think the, the key elements came in in the edit room for sure. You know, we had a very general broad idea that this was about a team of guys who were up against the odds, trying to break into an industry in a world that they... Uh, couldn't have access to previously, but that was only one part of the story. Yeah. And the more time we spent with the guys, the more we realised that there was a really lovely, subtle element to this story and, and quite nuanced in the sense that what they were doing in the competition was trying to work out where these wines are from, what's the origin of these wines, where do the wines belong? And at the same time, as, as refugees, these guys were asking themselves the question, what, where's home to me? And that, that's, that's sort of where we, we ended up really diving into with this concept of kamusha, the Shona word for your roots, your origin, your home. And you know, we start the film with that and we end the film with that. And we thought that was a really powerful arc for us to, to follow. And, and, and so that only really took shape after the competition, after we got the ability to spend time with the guys, after Robert Mugabe was forced to resign and we were lucky enough to be able to travel back to Zimbabwe and see the homes um, where, where they grew up. 
there's an intelligence and there's an integrity to these four men that, that courses through your film. It, I mean, there's some reviewers and some interviewers have made reference to Cool Runnings, but it was very clear from very early on that this wasn't going to be the, the wine industry version of that film. What, what did you have to get right about their story to, to one of these men to, to get across what they'd achieved? Look, I, I, I think, um, you know, like all documentaries, you never quite know where it's going to take you. You, you have a, an, an idea uh, uh, that, that might um, reveal itself, but you're never quite sure. And so these four guys, ostensibly, it was about four guys that knew nothing about wine that had become sommeliers and were challenging at the world championships. So it was really um, uh, on the surface of it, a story about four guys going to a competition. But we knew it would end up being much deeper than that. And uh, during the course of the interviews with the four guys, it, um, it just became a much more interesting story. It was a story of survival for a start, getting across the border uh, from, um, from Zimbabwe, away from that repression of Robert Mugabe and, and, and really fleeing across the border into what they thought was sanctuary in South Africa. And when they arrived in South Africa, it was no better. And there was discrimination, uh, you know, they had everything stolen, they were starving. Um, so learning what their what the barriers were for them to to get to this stage, you know, they were uh, they were insurmountable, almost insurmountable barriers, cultural, um, you know, racial, um, certainly financial, mm. um, religious, even, um, you know, they were Pentecostal Christians. So how does that work with a, a career in alcohol? You're not meant to drink alcohol if you're a Pentecostal Christian. So they had to ask their parents, is this OK if I if I follow this path, and one of the questions, one of the one of the questions back to them was, "Do you think this is God's calling?" And uh, and and um, one of the guys said, "Yeah, I think it is." Then you know, go ahead and do it. So it was a much more interesting story than what we thought it was going to be in the first place, and and therefore much more of a story than Cool Runnings. The the bond that these four men have with their country, and and the term nationalism has taken on this ugly hue in in recent times. But their love for their homeland of Zimbabwe um, is integral to what to what motivates them. Um, that comes through in in you know the, the ties to their family. Certainly, in the beautiful cinematography in the film, you capture what a beautiful part of the world Zimbabwe really is. What did you learn, and what does the film maybe say about that bond between man and nature, and about what can be a very pure bond? It actually initially shocked us. I think the bond that they had knowing that they had been rejected by their government and pushed to the side and, and forced to endure starvation and leave their family behind as they go to another country, to an unknown, to try and you know, get money to send back to provide food. It, it immediately to us, our knee-jerk reaction was, oh, they must hate Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually quite shocking initially to appreciate the love for which they have. And Robert Mugabe to them wasn't a person who um, just took everything. They, they do see the, the good that he did and, the, and some of the good that they outlined was the education system that he created. And that's what led to them being really well educated and despite the economic uh, downturn, or, yeah, to say that, to, not to minimise it all, but they, they, were, they were computer software engineers and accountants. These are skilled labour and that was because of the education system. So despite the fact that it forced them to flee their own land, it did also provide them opportunities. But I think the reason that they do have this strong love that is just so enduring is because of the potential that they see in Zimbabwe. I do think that they, that they all they want to do is go back there and all they want to do is unlock that potential from up and coming people who are also as skilled and as optimistic and as determined as they are. I remember we were in between shoots traveling on a train and, and asking them questions, just chatting, developing the rapport so camera's not rolling. And I said, you guys are in an industry whereby you can travel anywhere in the world. You know, you can work at restaurants in, in Paris, in London, in, in, in New York. If you could be in any, anywhere you want to go, where would you, where would you like to work? And they all said categorically Zimbabwe. We just want to go home. And that also floored me. It, you know, it just, it, it was amazing the bond that they, the, they had. We, we describe it as umbilical almost, you know, uh, and, uh, and yeah, amazing to see. I mean, Simon, just to follow up on that a little bit, that, that concept of, of um, you know, man's connection to nature, 
um, is something that we began feeling very early with these guys. And certainly with Tinochet, when he began telling that story of climbing the mountains uh, with, his, with his grandfather, when they used to go hunting in the mountains and the indigenous fruits that they would find, the Nunguru, the Nengani, uh, And, you know, we just had this feeling that this was a story of origin you know, very much about origin. And in, in wine, uh, in the wine business, you always talk about wine origin uh, and where is the wine from and, and how's the taste and, and, and what characteristics does it have? What, what terroir is it from? And, um, you know, when, when Tinochet particularly started talking about that, um, that whenever he stands on that particular soil in his, in his grandfather's farm, you know, he feels that he's rooted to this earth, you know, that expression of rooted to the earth and in the same way that vines are rooted to the earth. So that it just became such a strong symbol for us, that, that sense of being tied to the earth of Zimbabwe. Warwick, as you mentioned previously, um, you're an established vineyard on. Um, eccentrics like Dennis or Denis, these are your people, aren't they? You run with this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I deny all association with Denny. <laughs> although, although he does text me every other day. <laughs> what, intensely what, annoying. what inside track did your knowledge of the industry afford you on, on both Red Obsession and now on, on Blind Ambition? Did it open doors or um, were they cautious of having cameras in the room? Look, I, I have to say that the connection, re the real connection to the wine industry for us is is our associate producer, Andrew Kayard, who's a master of wine. And as you know, there are only 250 or thereabouts in the world. So they're a rare beast. And um, Andrew uh, was extremely well known in Bordeaux and has the keys to just about every chateau. So Red Obsession um, is really largely thanks to Andrew. And, and it's because we did Red Obsession and managed to you know, achieve a good result with that film that we were able to do this film, the four Zimbabwean guys had, had seen Red Obsession, had, had known it and loved it, and then, uh, and then sort of invited us to tell this story of theirs. So um, Andrew was really the connection, and I, and I think it was um, Red Obsession gave, gave natural sort of step through to Blind Ambition. Did, um, did Team Zimbabwe ever taste any of the, the Port C Pinot Noir or any of the Shardy? Did they give an, an opinion on your wine? Yes, 100% apparently. <laughs> 100 was, points. 100 points, yeah. They thought it was brilliant, which is surprising, but, you know, I'll take it. Oh, good, good, good. Um, I guess, finally, you, you, you leapt into this film with a, a documentary maker's fearlessness. Um, you undertook a story without an ending, and there are a couple of moments where, I guess, but for fate, you might have only had a documentary short. Um, what compels you to take that risk to fund and, and film true life stories? What, what satisfaction does it give you guys? I think uh, for us, it was the bare bones of this story and not knowing where it was going to go that was the most exciting. And the fact that having Skype with the guys, we saw that they had potential and we saw that um, the way that they interacted with each other uh, they weren't just four boring guys. These were guys that were immediately interesting and it came across on screen on Zoom when we, when we chatted with them to try and uh, arrange everything. And I think without that dynamic and that rapport amongst themselves, we probably wouldn't have jumped into this as, uh, as quickly as we did. But that gave us so much comfort. And, you know, it was, we needed a lot of comfort because it was a hell of a risk to, you know, grab, grab a crew in a matter of weeks and, and jump on a plane and be in Cape Town filming, um, having only met the guys on Zoom three weeks before. So there's also this excitement in this world, you know, where you go, oh, where is this story going to go? There are, there are lots of fantastic opportunities to tell documentaries about stories that have happened. But as stories unfold and to be there at that front is really exciting. And there were moments where Warwick and I were thinking, oh, gosh, if this goes this way, we, do we have a story? Oh, if it goes that way the story is too good and people are going to think we've made it up. It's scripted. <laughs> and so there was, it was just, I think it's the, <laughs> it's the excitement, the adrenaline rush. I mean, you're, you're running on adrenaline and adrenaline when you're, um, yeah. you know, when you're making these films. And I think that that's what gets us over the line to take those risks. Yeah, it does. But also, you know, we're storytellers, you know, I, I think if you're a storyteller, it's just in your blood. You just love to tell, tell good stories. And when you see something like this come across your desk, you, you, you just, um, you know, you have to be able to do it somehow. And you're not quite sure how you're going to finance it. So Rob and I tend to roll the dice a little bit for the, for the first month or two 
um, because there's no time to raise finance, uh, you know, from the government or even from investors. I mean, I think the, the, the time gap between Jancis Robinson telling us about this story and, um, and us being on the ground in Cape Town was four weeks, right? Yeah. Four weeks, yeah. Wow. So, you know, we had no time to, to waste. And, and documentary by its nature is something that you need to respond to immediately if there are events unfolding and they were unfolding all the time. So you just take a punt, you dive in, you, you hope you're gonna find investors down the track, which, you know, luckily, especially uh, um, due to Rob, you know, we, we managed to do, he's very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations! All that that energy and that excitement, and and um, certainly the the passion of it is all up there on the screen um, in your filmmaking and in the journey that these four men take us on. Blind Ambition uh, in cinemas on March three through Mad Men Entertainment. Warwick Ross and Robco, thanks very much for being part of Screen Watching. Congratulations on this this beautiful film. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Simon, very much. All right, guys. Bye, bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye.